morning and welcome to Tea with Dr. Jermaine smith Ball. I am the president and CEO of the Urban League of Broward County and today I'm going to be sipping tea with our superintendent of school, Robert Runcy. Hi, Dr. Robert Runcy. I love to call you back. You know that. No, 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 no. <laughs> call me, call me Bob, please. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, I love yeah. it. I, I love being in the same space with you and the time that we're going to spend together today, I'm sure is going to be really enlightening for everyone to to hear and, and to be able to listen to all the things that you're going to share. So again, just lovely. Yeah, to yeah. Be with you. And then and be, before we get started, I want to like take this privilege to let everyone listening um, just know about your amazing leadership oh, and what you do with Urban League. No, it really, I, I know you won't do it um, because you're a very humble person. Uh, but yeah, you know, your leadership has just been extraordinary. It's recognized nationally in terms of what you do. And if one looks at where the Urban League is now versus when you took over it, um, that is a huge legacy uh, and something to be proud of. We're all proud of it. And, it's, and at the end of the day, it's benefiting uh, uh -huh. the constituents in the community and that's what matters the most so thank you for all that um you do here in Broward County well Superintendent Runcy I thank you so much for that and I could say the same for you I mean your tenure here within our school board has definitely yielded positive benefits and then we find ourselves in the spring of 2020 and that is etched in history yeah. as a time when our schools closed. And I don't think we ever thought that that would happen, right? But when we think about the adverse effects of COVID-19 on education, and we're gonna have the opportunity to talk about racial equity in education, the shutting down of the schools, unemployment, uh, severe learning disruptions, you know, for our young people and the families uh, that we both serve, the coronavirus has definitely shone a spotlight on the disparities that existed pre pre corona to the time where we are today. So I just wanted to get from you as you lead the sixth largest school district in the nation. That is something. How is COVID-19 exacerbating opportunity gaps and what steps will Broward County schools take or really you've already taken in order to close those gaps for our students and their families? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ball. I will say that COVID-19, the pandemic has absolutely um, exacerbated and revealed um, gaps and holes and fissures in our social safety net for our children and our families. Uh, and foremost, as we closed our campuses on March uh, 13th, uh, we never closed learning. So we try to continue that virtually. That's not the most optimal way, but we wanted to make sure there was continuity uh, in learning for students. And I'll address that topic um, a little bit later. But first and foremost, we had to step up um, and really provide services to our community. Uh, number one, we have a large portion of our students who rely on meals at school. 65% of the 260,000 students in Broward County rely on free and reduced meals. Uh, for some students, that may be the best or only meal that they'll get for the day. So it was an absolute imperative that we put a plan in place immediately to deliver meals. And we delivered millions of meals um, over several months um, at 52 sites in, in Broward County. Uh, where we had grab and go meals. Um, kudos to our food service workers for getting out there each and every day um, and helping to make that happen. Number two, we focused on the digital divide. Uh, you can't have virtual learning if you don't have computers and internet access. So we were fortunate to be able to um, reduce our student to computer ratio over the past several years to our bond referendum. We had gone from roughly six, six students to a computer. Um, to a one-to-one -one scenario in Broward County. We built up our infrastructure. That really put us in a really good opportunity to say, hey, why are these computers gonna sit in our schools when the kids are at home and they need them? So we basically said, anyone who needs a computer, um, you just come to your local school, we'll give it to you, no questions asked, you fill out the form so we can track it. And we gave out over 120,000 laptop computers. Um, we also uh, negotiated uh, with Comcast, I know that something the Urban League has done already for the community through internet essentials. We built awareness to our families that you can get that for $9.95 per month. We did a similar deal with AT&T. 
Uh, then we secured several thousand mobile hotspots for those with housing insecurity, homeless students, so that they would be able to have uh, mobile uh, internet connectivity uh, anywhere, anytime. So that dealt with, with that particular uh, component of it. Um, so as, we, as we've gone through this, one of the things that we've learned um, is that um, not only has this pandemic revealed uh, numerous uh, inequities, uh, it's, it's particularly hard hit on those students, um, the poor, those in minority, uh, typically underserved communities, um, where when you close schools, um, they, you don't have an opportunity to deliver all the services and supports you need to deliver to them. Um, and, but we worked hard to make sure that we continue to provide mental health services. Um, our social workers were out there. Um, I, I think by the time we got to the summer, they had delivered um, over uh, 36,000 uh, um, referrals and uh, over 160,000 interventions. Um, that number is only continuing to grow. I throw those numbers out to point out that our social workers, family counselors, psychiatrists, um, other um, staff, they have continued to work to deliver um, services even though um, it was virtual for a large uh, period of time. Uh, but we opened our schools and campuses back on October 9th, uh, fully recognizing that uh, we have to do two things. Number one, we had to get many of these kids back into schools, as many as we could, create that option for our families so they could get face-to-face -face instruction um, and services uh, that they needed. Uh, number two, we had to make sure that we did it in a way that provided confidence for everyone, staff, students, and families, that the schools were safe. Um, so we put in all the protocols we needed to. We worked with our local medical experts, our public health officials, um, and we take guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We put all those things together to make sure that we put in the protocols and the measures that were necessary. And I'm glad to report to you today that even though we've had reported over 600 cases um, since we opened up our schools, um, and that's from a population of, again, over 260,000 students and about 30,000 employees, that um, literally less than a handful of those cases can be connected to any transmission um, in schools. So all of these cases that we're identifying and tracking, the individuals are contracting them through transmission um, and, and infection outside of the school districts. The net of, the net of all of this is our schools are probably the safest places in our community um, to actually go. They are not places where secondary transmission and infection of the coronavirus pandemic is occurring. Um, so I would encourage all of our families, especially those in um, our underserved communities, especially those students who are struggling, um, that they, they select and the option to come back into school. Our schools are still open. Only about 30% of our students are actually attending face-to-face. Uh, we can accommodate 50 to 60 percent and still maintain physical distancing, all our protocols. So we have room and opportunity there. And um, yesterday, the governor's office um, and a commissioner uh, issued an executive order. Uh, and I, I agree with it wholeheartedly uh, that one says we're going to keep our schools open. And I agree because they're not places where we're seeing infection. So we need to keep them open, close the bars close the restaurants, close everything else, but keep the schools open. Um, the, the other piece is that students who are struggling are not engaged, um, that they really are gonna be required to come back into school face-to-face -face, uh, and the parents are gonna have to sign a waiver if they elect not to do so. So we're gonna be pretty aggressive about making sure that students that are falling behind, that we're able to grab them, catch them up, and make sure that they're going to get the interventions and services and supports they need so that they can stay on grade level and continue to progress. Um, so that's absolutely essential. That's what keeps me up at night is worrying about um, the students who are falling out. And there are students and their families out there that have support systems. Um, they like the learning modality. You know, they're, they're not missing a beat. I'm, I've heard of cases and 
uh, I've heard from parents where their students that are thriving in this environment, they're less distracted, they're more focused, uh, but that doesn't work for every student. And we got to acknowledge that and uh, we got to make sure we reach out to those kids and, and bring them back into the fold. Wow, Superintendent Runcie, I'm telling you that you have truly been earning your paycheck during this time with the school board members, the teachers and the like. I have to tell you, there is an educator in my home and I do know that you are doing everything that you can to keep everybody safe. But I love it when you said that, you know, our schools never closed for learning. I love that, you know, we never closed for learning and we never closed for support for our families and for our children. And I just absolutely commend the work that you um, and your team have been doing. In addition to COVID-19, Clearly, racial equity in education is something that you have been very vocal about. And even in the discussion related to the learning challenges that some individuals, some of our students might have, whether they're from a low income background or a high income background, uh, learning is learning. Talk to me a little bit about how the role of racial equity in public education systems, what do you see as that role? And what opportunities do we have um, in terms of impacting the environment and the outcome for students? What, what are you gonna charge us to do as your backup system here in the community? You know, you know what's interesting about that, that question is, you know, is, is in some ways the right question, right? And, and so, when you when you wind back to Brown versus Board of Education, uh, May 1954, um, you know one has to look at where we are today, and 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 I could argue, and many could, that our schools are as segregated, maybe more, more segregated in some ways than even back then. Um, and you know, I, I was reading an interesting piece that really made me uh, think about this more, and it was. Um, a piece by Derek Bell on this topic. Derek Bell was a Harvard law professor. He was the first tenured African-American Harvard law professor. And I have a note around here from a more statement that he made on this particular topic um, where he once argued that civil rights lawyers were misguided in requiring racial balance of each school student population as a, the measure of compliance and the guarantee of effective schooling. Bell argued that educational equity rather than integrated idealism was the appropriate goal, right? So basically what that says, look, if Brown had been different and it wasn't just focused on integration, but actual equity in education, which means every kid has a right and will get high quality teachers, the financial investment the, per student would be the same, if that was the goal, we may have a different type of um, outcome today. But the way that was written and it focused on integration and the term that the Supreme Court put in with that, with all deliberate speed, people determined that on their own. So one of the things that um, you know, I think we need to continue to look at is how resources are being allocated uh, within our systems. And we gotta make sure that that is done equitably and fairly across every school in Broward County, whether you're in Pompano, Deerfield, um, Miramar, Hollywood, Weston, you know, we've got to make sure that, that we're doing all the investments um, for all our, our kids. And that has really been the underlying premise of how this administration and our school board has gone about making decisions on initiatives that we put in the district. So when we allocate technology, right, we talked about how we had all these resources to close the digital divide. Well, when we reduced that student to computer ratio, we did that across the entire district. So every school had, had even though they started out at different places, schools would get varying degrees of investment to make sure at the end of the day, they were all the same level. So, you know, equity doesn't mean equal in terms of investment because sometimes you got to put more resources in to get folks to the same um, level. And so we've been conscious about doing that. Um, then there's the other segment, right? Which, so that first piece, that's allocation of resources. The other part of uh, uh, racial uh, equity and dealing with uh, inequality in public education, um, I think it boils down to dealing with the 
the structures and the systems, which are also tied to a third component, which are just culture, um, implicit biases and beliefs. And just to give you some examples of them, you look at school discipline. Um, and I have a interesting um, chart. I know that uh, minority students in particular, black males, significantly overrepresented um, in school discipline. It's a statistical anomaly. Then when you actually look out into the community, and I had the most recent data from the 17th Circuit uh, Court here in Broward County for the most, uh, the, the most recent data I've got, which is from the 2019 uh, calendar year, that although white students may, this is ages 10 to 17, um, white students made up 26% uh, of the population, black students, uh, 36, Hispanic, 33. But when you look at arrest, white students only 13%. Remember, they're at 26% uh, of the population, so half represented. But black students are at 70%, even though they're only 36%. And Hispanic students are at 17. So that disproportionality that you see there is reflected all the way throughout how schools are dealing with, with discipline. Um, and so we've worked hard within Broward County to modify our discipline approaches where, um, one, we obviously have to keep students accountable, but we need to create a system where they're actually learning from those mistakes, that we're providing support, and we're getting to the root cause of a lot of this behavior. And so we provide um, counselors, um, um, psychiatrists, uh, lots of different types of supports, and really start looking at what's going on with this student um, in, their, in the context of their whole family situation. Um, so that's been uh, part of the work as well. Uh, we've done a lot about uh, really trying to get um, our school system to um, deal with some of the um, issues that uh, sometimes are difficult, but they're absolutely necessary to have, conversations to have. So um, having uh, courageous conversations about race uh, Glenn Singleton's uh, course has been offered throughout the district. Uh, we've had school board members who have actually um, taken it, senior staff. Um, now all of our principals are actually going through it as well. Uh, we've had um, teachers, um, students. Um, it continues to grow um, as we really provide a mechanism and an opportunity for um, staff, students, our entire community to um, discuss racial issues and the impact and how their perception uh, and biases that they develop, and we all have them, how that gets into the classroom um, and it can impact what we, what we do. Um, we also have uh, worked to put uh, different uh, things in place uh, to, uh, to really give our students the opportunity to have um, voice, uh, to have agency, uh, speech and debate has been a big one for us. Uh, we've expanded that now to the largest speech and debate program in the country, not because we just wanted to make it large, but we uh, feel very strongly that opportunities to engage in speech and debate um, really helps kids to develop the life skills they need, helps to give them voice. And within our speech and debate programs, we have um, injected um, social justice themes and initiatives. So some of the very topics that we um, see that we're dealing with, it could be um, uh, mass incarceration, uh, the, the, the tension between police uh, and, the, and the black community. Um, all of those things are topics that um, students debate uh, within our speech and debate programs and do it in a way that they're looking at both sides of issues um, and are able to really have a, a good understanding. And so hopefully the next generation is gonna be a lot more informed, at least the generation of kids that are coming out of Broward County. Um, and I'll just tell you a quick uh, note on that. I had a, a number of uh, emails from current students and former students in Broward County uh, around the time of the George Floyd murder um, that was um, witnessed by, by this um, nation. And one of the themes that I remembered from a couple of these students is said, look, I had a great education in Broward County, but I felt that um, I was left a little short because we never discussed these issues of 
racial equity, implicit bias, um, systemic racism, et cetera. And they're basically pushing to have opportunities um, to learn about these um, issues um, in very uh, constructive ways. And so uh, we will continue to uh, work to provide more and more opportunities on that front as we go forward in Broward County. That's absolutely great, Superintendent Runcie. And, and to your point, you know, getting proximate with the students, you all have done such a great job of meeting students where they are. So as we wrap up our morning tea together, I wanted to ask uh, this question. So you are leading the sixth largest school district in the nation. You have students, family, staff, the list goes on and on. And you mentioned that, you know, the thing that keeps you up at night are the students who may be lagging, may not be able to, not moving forward in the way that we might all want our children to move forward. So if you had to tell a parent, um, a community leader like myself and others who might be listening, um, what is one thing that you would like to charge us with? So charge our parents, give us a charge, I'm a parent. Give us a charge as um, community leaders to be able to be the wind beneath your wings related to supporting and educating our young people. What can we do to help? Yeah, you know, there is so much, but you can't do everything. So you gotta be focused on something. Um, you know, there was a, a time where, you know, people like shed blood and struggle to have an opportunity for um, African-American students to be able to go to public schools and get an education. And uh, somehow we have to revive that um, sense of value of, of what that is. And I, I think that um, embracing these kids. So we have mentoring programs in uh, Broward County schools, right? We have a lot of, we have Mentoring Tomorrow's Leaders, 5,000 Role Models, which we adopted, started by uh, Congresswoman uh, Frederica Wilson. Uh, we have Latinos in Action. We have lots of these um, programs, but the, and, and the students that get engaged in the, these uh, programs, um, you know, they turn themselves around. The success stories are just re remarkable. Um, but what they all tell us is that every child needs to be connected to a caring adult. They value relationships and everything first and foremost. Most kids aren't going to school necessarily just because of the academics. Yes, that's they, they get that from there, but it's really about the relationships and connections. And to the extent that we can have adults in the community um, or other youth be able to connect with kids to make sure that they're um, staying focused and they're getting the help and support and encouragement they need. Um, that's probably the biggest thing that needs to needs to occur. Uh, we just don't have enough of that, and you know, consequently, uh, we have some of our youth that you know they're just disconnected, and once they get disconnected, um, they they're out in the streets trying to find their purpose. Um, and that's not where we want them to be. So um, I, I say, everyone, if you haven't wrapped your arms around a kid or connected someone um, outside of those in your, you know, in your home, um, now's the time to do that. It's it's never been more true than it is now that it takes a village to raise a child. Most families aren't going to be able to do that themselves. But if we can actually come together as a collective and make sure that we continue every opportunity we can to reinforce to these kids that, hey, school is important, we care about you, and do whatever we can to support these kids, um, I think we'll end up in a much better place. Superintendent Runcie, it has been a pleasure having morning tea with you. I will tell you that that last charge of making sure that we're wrapping our arms literally and figuratively, right, around uh, children who are not in our homes is so important. And it is really rewarding. And there are many, many opportunities to do that. So I have one charge for you, Superintendent Runcie. As we go through the remainder of this year, 
I want you to remain encouraged. I want you to keep that clarity of vision that you've always been able to communicate um, from the dais of the school board. And we will be here to continue to support your work and the work of your team. So it has been absolutely a pleasure. So as long as you tell me that you got that and you're gonna give me a thumbs up on that, I will absolutely let you go this morning. It has been a pleasure talking to you and all these nuggets that you have dropped on us this morning. Again, thank you so much uh, for your leadership in the community. Um, the Urban League is an absolute valued partner um, in this process of educating our students and families. And so it's not just about what happens in our schools for six, seven hours a day. There's um, the other um, two thirds of the time where they're out of school and the Urban League certainly plays a big role uh, in making sure that that time is also productive and well spent. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Runcie.